I'm going to read an excerpt from The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Chapter 11, Making Smaller Circles. Let's say that I'm cultivating a certain martial technique. For a simple example, a classic straight punch. I stand with my left leg forward, my hands up by my head to protect my face. The jab is a short punch coming from the left forward hand. The straight is the power punch coming from the ground, generating through my left foot and moving through my left leg torso diagonally across and up to the right side of my back, through the shoulder, tricep, and finally delivered by the second and third knuckles of my right hand. First, I practice the motion over and over in slow motion. We have to be able to do something slowly before we can have any hope of doing it correctly with speed. I release my left hip, wind up, and spring the right hand into motion as my left foot and hip joint spin my waist and upper body into action. Initially, I'll have tension in my shoulder or back, but then I'll soothe it away, slowly repeating the movement until the correct body mechanics are in my skin. Over time, I'm not thinking about the path from foot to fist. I'm just feeling the ground connecting to my fingertips, as if my body is a conduit for the electrical impulse of the punch. Then I start speeding things up, winding up and delivering over and over. Eventually, I start using a heavy bag, practicing these body mechanics with increasing power, building resistance in my body, so I can deliver more and more force without hurting myself. My coiling gets stronger, and sometimes I hit the bag with a surprising pop. A dangerous moment. When, when hitting something, instead of moving through empty space, I might start to get excited and throw my shoulder into the punch. This is a classic error. It breaks my structure and destroys the connection from foot to fingertip. Many boxers make this mistake and come away with shoulder injuries. I want to punch without punching. No intention. My teacher, William Chen, sometimes teaches punching by telling students to pour a cup of tea. It's a beautiful thing. Pouring tea creates the perfect punch because people's minds don't get in the way. Okay, so now weeks and months, maybe years, pass with the cultivation of the right straight punch. I know how to wind up properly. When I hit the bag, nothing hurts. There are no breaks in my structure. It feels as if the ground is smashing the bag through my fist and my body mechanics are smooth and relaxed. I've also built up quite a bit of power from all the work with winding up, coiling and releasing the body into motion. When throwing my right, I don't think about anything technical anymore. My body just knows the right feeling and does it. No mind. It's in the blood. I've learned how to throw a straight right. But not really. The thing is, unless they're flustered or caught in an awkward moment, a good fighter is rarely going to get caught with a big, old, long, wound-up straight punch. It's just too obvious. This is where making smaller circles comes into play. By now, the body mechanics of the punch have been condensed in my mind to a feeling. I don't need to hear or see any effect. My body knows when it is operating correctly by an internal sense of harmony. A parallel would be a trained singer who, through years of practice, knows what the notes feel like vibrating inside. Then she's given a concert in a big venue and the sound system is a nightmare. From on stage, she can't hear herself at all. A surprisingly common occurrence. The great performer can deliver a virtuoso performance without hearing a thing, because she knows how the notes should feel coming out. Even if her primary monitor, her ears, are temporarily unavailable. So I know what a properly delivered straight right feels like. Now I begin to slowly, incrementally condense my movements while maintaining that feeling. Instead of a big wind up in the hips, I coil a little less and then I release the punch. While initially I may have thrown my straight from next to my ear, now I gradually inch my hand out, starting the punch from closer and closer to the target. And I don't lose power. The key is to take small steps, so the body can barely feel the condensing practice. Each little refinement is monitored by the feeling of the punch, which I gained from months or years of training with the large traditional motion. 
slowly but surely, my body mechanics get more and more potent. My waist needs little movement to generate speed. My hand can barely move and still deliver a powerful blow. Eventually, I can deliver a straight punch that looks nothing like a straight punch. If you've ever watched some of the most explosive hitters in the boxing world, for instance, Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali, you've seen fights where knockouts look completely unrealistic. Sometimes you have to watch in slow motion over and over to see any punch at all. They have condensed large circles into very small ones and made their skills virtually invisible to the untrained eye. The chassic manifestations of this phenomenon are quite interesting. For example, arguably the most fundamental chess principle is central control. At all levels of play, the competitor who dominates the middle of the chessboard will usually have an advantage, because from this placement, his or her pieces can influence the entire battle. Curiously, if you study the games of some very strong grandmasters, they seem to completely disregard this principle. The British star Michael Adams might be the clearest case in point. His pieces are often on the flanks, and he appears to casually give opponents central dominance, and yet he wins. The secret behind this style of play is a profound internalization of the principles behind central domination. Michael Adams knows how to control the center without appearing to have anything to do with the center. He has made the circles so small, even grandmasters cannot see them. This concept of making smaller circles has been a critical component of my learning process in chess and the martial arts. In both fields, players tend to get attached to fancy techniques and fail to recognize that subtle internalization and refinement is much more important than the quantity of what is learned. I think it was this understanding that won me my first Push Hands National Championship in November 2000, after just two years of Tai Chi study. Surely, many of my opponents knew more about Tai Chi than I did, but I was very good at what I did know. I had condensed my body mechanics into a potent state, while most of my opponents had large, elegant, and relatively impractical repertoires. The fact is that when there is intense competition, those who succeed have slightly more honed skills than the rest. It is rarely a mysterious technique that drives us to the top, but rather a profound mastery of what may well be a basic skill set. Depth beats breadth any day of the week, because it opens a channel for the intangible, unconscious, creative components of our hidden potential.